Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In St. Louis County in Missouri, a four-year-old child was playing in the backyard when a large, hairy creature appeared from the woods and grabbed him and attempted to run back into the woods with him. The aunt, who saw this, screamed and the family dog started barking furiously and went after the tall, hairy humanoid, who dropped the little four-year-old boy and ran back into the woods. No tracks or signs of such a strange animal were found, though. On to the next one. One summer in Scott County in Missouri. I'm from Scott City, and I moved when I was young, but still have family there. There is a fishing spot called the Bar Pit in a pretty remote area near the river. And my grandfather was the caretaker for many years. When we would visit, I would always go with Grandpa to open the gates and close the gates. Well, to make a long story short, I saw it and so did Grandpa. He said not to worry. He wouldn't bother nothing. He saw them every once in a while. I never said anything till now. The sighting occurred when the witness was 10 or 12 years old. At the time, his grandfather was the caretaker of a property which was kept locked at night. Certain people could pay a fee and use boats which were kept there. His grandfather would unlock the gates and check on the boats in the morning. Early one summer morning, the witness accompanied his grandfather. When they got out of the truck, something stood up on the far side of the lake near the dam, about 50 yards away. The creature was taller than his grandfather, who was over six feet. He estimated the height at six and a half to seven feet. It was covered in black hair, which was matted on one side, like it had been laying down. The hair was relatively long, about like an Irish setter. The creature did not have much of a noticeable neck, no visible ears, and most of the facial details were obscured by the hair. It had big hands and just stood there looking at us. His grandfather said, Don't worry about him, boy. He won't bother nothing, and turned the witness away toward the boat. When I turned around to look again, it was gone. On to the next one. In Cass County in Missouri, about two weeks after the cornfields were picked, we lived two miles southwest of Strasburg, Missouri by Big Creek. I was out fishing on the creek about half a mile from my house. I had been fishing for about six hours and it was starting to get dark. I kept hearing something up above me on the top of the bank. I was in the creek about 12 feet down. At first, I thought it was a dog or something. My dog used to come down where I was fishing. The fish were biting great, so I wasn't paying too much attention to anything else. Then I smelled something that smelled like a cross between a hog and a skunk. It would come and go. I thought that there was a skunk up there. Like I said, the fish were biting good. When it started to get dark, I started loading up my fishing gear to go and thought I would make two trips up the bank. One with the poles and bait and one with the fish. To be able to go up the bank I had to walk up the bank about 100 feet to where there was a small creek running in and climb the bank there. Well, I walked around and up the bank to lay my poles down and thought I saw something up the bank where I was fishing, but really didn't get a good glimpse of it. I started back down the bank back to where the fish were. As I rounded the curve in the creek, I saw something that looked like a giant gorilla picking up the stringer of fish. I froze. I thought I might be seeing things or something because it was starting to get dark. 
Then the creature turned and looked at me and took off with one of my stringers of fish. It jumped over the creek almost to the other side, about 12 feet or so, then ran up the embankment and disappeared. I was scared, lifeless, and froze. It took me a minute or so to realize what had happened. I had never seen anything like it. It was dark color, tall, and covered with hair, except for the bottom of its buttocks, which were bare of hair. Its arms were long, and it held the stringer in a human fashion. It left footprints. I went back up the bank, grabbed my pole, and ran for home, checking over my shoulder all the way through the open cornfield. I tried to tell my mom and dad, but they said I was just seeing things, and it was probably just someone's monkey that got away or something, and I thought it looked big. But I tell you, if it were a monkey, it was about an eight-foot monkey. I wanted to take my dad back to see the footprint in the mud, and he said we would go down the next morning. But that night, it rained hard, and the creeks were up. I never went back down there fishing again. Before that happened, it was my favorite spot to fish. I had just about forgotten about it until I found and read Bigfoot reports online. One made me remember all the details. One other time, about ten years ago, I was deer hunting down by the lake of the Ozarks by Climax Springs on a friend's land. I've hunted there many times. The land has three quarters of a mile right of way to just drive in. Anyway, I had been taking my son hunting with me for several years, and it was his first three year for me to let him hunt by himself on a separate strand. He was about 200 yards from me. Anyway, I kept having a strange feeling, and it felt like the hair standing on the back of my neck for about 10 minutes or so. I couldn't see anything unusual. Then, suddenly, I heard my son shoot, so I climbed down to go help him dress the deer. When I got there, he was still in his stand and pale as a ghost. I asked him what happened, and he said he saw a huge buck right below him by the stand and shot it. He said it walked about 10 feet and fell down. Then he heard something funny and was looking around, and he said he'd seen something by his deer, and he looked the other way because he was scared. He said he was hoping if he didn't look at it, the thing wouldn't see him. He never really saw what it was, for sure, because of the small cedar trees. He said that the head came just above the trees. The trees were approximately eight feet high, give or take a foot. My son said when he looked back, the deer was gone. Well, I figured he just had buck fever because it was the first big buck he ever shot while by himself. So we walked to where the deer should have been, and it was gone. It looked like about a gallon of blood was on the ground. There was a big puddle all over. There was also a trail of blood. So I followed it, thinking the deer was just wounded real bad and would find it before long. By the time the blood trail stopped, I know I must have seen about a gallon or two of blood. There was no way a deer could go that far with that much blood loss. Finally, after about an hour of tracking and trying to find the deer, we found one of the legs that looked like it had been literally torn off the deer. Then, about half an hour later, part of another leg. But never did I find the deer. I have probably killed 35 to 40 deer in my lifetime with a rifle, bow, and black powder, and have never seen anything like that before. It had to be something big enough to pick up and carry a deer off like that, leaving no drag trail. Strange. I don't tell anyone about these things because I don't want them to think I'm crazy, but I know what I saw and heard what happened and nothing will ever convince me otherwise. On to the next one. In Oregon County in Missouri, this is a true story which I remember very well, even though it has been around 30 years since it happened. 
I owned three dogs at this time, two hounds and a squirrel dog. They turned up missing for about three days. Well, on the night of that third day, I had a wind-up alarm clock set up inside of a wash pan because I was so hard to wake up. Sometime between 10 and 11 p.m., my wife shook me awake, saying the dogs must be back. She heard some growling noises real close to the house. When I heard the noise, I told my wife, that ain't no dog. It was the weirdest growling sound I'd ever heard. I jumped out of bed so fast, I hit the dishpan, and it went across the floor and made a lot of racket. I looked out the window through the window screen, and there was what must have been a Bigfoot creature of some sort. It was not a bear. It was a very moonlit night, so I know I couldn't mistake a bear for something else. And it was not human. It was covered in long, wavy hair on its body, but much less hair around the facial area. It had a human-like face, and yet it wasn't human. Suddenly, it turned its head, not its body, just its head, and stared in my direction. I started to feel a panic coming back on, but I knew I had to do something. I raced to get my shotgun and ran out the front door. I was sure I could reach the yard in time, but it was gone, even though there shouldn't have been time for it to pass the clearing of the yard. So, I fired the shotgun into the air, just in case it was still close by. Less than one day later, our dogs returned us. It was a very clear, moonlit night in a forested area two miles from Eleven Point River. On to the next one. I was a boy, 13 years old, and my friend and I were riding our bikes in a remote part of the Santa Cruz Mountains in what today is a state park. However, at the time, this was private land that had been logged over in the late 1800s and early 20th century. This land is steep, treed with redwood and coastal oaks, very dense and rugged. Nothing in the way of logging, ranching, or man-made activity was happening, or for that matter, since the last logging of the 1920s. This was a place that maybe saw a handful of people a year. We had pushed our bikes uphill for the last two hours and were riding downhill on an old fire road. We were going fast and quiet when I slowed down for a muddy spot so as to not lose control. I noticed to my right, just behind a redwood tree, a figure that was about the same color of the tree bark, dark brown. It stepped from behind the tree and ran downhill. I stopped, dropped my bike, and ran the 20 feet to the edge of the road. By this time, it was running fast with the unmistakable sound of two feet treading on tan bark oak leaves. The creature was over six feet tall and had the shape of a man. I have camped in the area since this encounter and have heard a high-pitched whistle sound and also a thumping of wood on wood more than once. Often, we had the sense of being watched and left the area because of this feeling. Years later, I rode a motorcycle at night near to my sighting. I stopped at Sandpoint Overlook and shut off the engine. A very strange noise came from the road just below the Overlook, where the road forks down to Hinkley Basin. It was a noise I have never heard before or since sort of a scream but different. As it approached coming up to the switchbacks, it got louder and it was beginning to cause me some alarm. Another rather close scream, I quickly started the engine and left full throttle. The elevation was approximately 1,000 feet. It was wooded with second growth redwoods mixed with California live oaks, madrones, and some chaparral. Hinkley Creek is where the creature was running toward. As I listened to his running for at least two minutes, it happened on the fire road between Sandpoint Overlook and Hinkley Creek. On to the next one. At Bluff Creek, 
near McKinleyville in Humboldt County in California, Mr. Roy Wallace, a construction worker, was asleep in a shed when he was woken by a commotion outside. He opened the door and an immense, hairy, man-like beast was standing right there in front of him. In a split-second gesture of appeasement, the man gave a chocolate bar to the beast, which took it and left. On to the next one. At Elk River, near Bluff Creek, near McKinley in Humboldt County in California, Mr. Curtis Mitchell, a Native American, found the bodies of four dogs and saw a tall, hairy humanoid that ran upright like a man that was eight to ten feet tall and wore nothing. The bodies of the four dogs were found that evening and had been ripped apart by some unknown animal. One had been slammed against a tree. The dog's bodies were found five miles south of Eureka. On to the next one. At Bluff Creek near McKinleyville in Humboldt County in California, Mr. Ray Kerr and Mr. Leslie Breezel saw a tall, hairy humanoid that ran upright like a man and was eight to ten feet tall and wore nothing. The witnesses were in a pickup truck and saw the Bigfoot cross the road ahead in two strides at night. On to the next one. At Riverside County in California, Mr. Charles Wetzel was in a car when it was attacked by a six-foot-tall humanoid with long arms and no ears. The creature had fluorescent shining eyes, a round head, and protuberant lips on its mouth, and all over its body it was scaly like leaves. Gurgling sounds came from it, and Charles was unsure if he hit it with the car originally, as there were long sweeping scratch lines on the windscreen found afterward. The witness was in the car at the time of the attack. At the same time, the radio station dissolved into static. The hairy humanoid clawed Charles, who had reached for his pistol and accelerated the car away. The happening was on the north end of Main Street, crossing the Santa Ana River. On to the next one. A husband and wife in a private plane spotted great tracks in the snow and followed them. Eventually, they saw an enormous humanoid covered in brown hair that was making the tracks. On to the next one. Near Maryville in Graff Valley in Yuba County. It was called Camp Beale and had some 80,000 acres. The Army abandoned the camp many years before this took place. The Air Force reopened it. I don't know if the barracks are still there or not. Likely not. A friend and I went deer hunting in the hills above Marysville, California. At the time, Beale Air Force Base was closed, so we went on the base in the mountain. We camped out in the old barracks area that first night. My friend had his two retriever dogs with him. It was dark and we were in our bedrolls. We heard a very loud yelling, almost a scream, coming from the woods about a hundred yards away. The dogs went crazy and headed toward the woods. My friend and I grabbed our rifles and followed them. I have never heard a sound like that before. Just as we got a short distance away from the woods, we saw something that the dogs were running around. It was on two feet. It grabbed one dog, threw it some distance, and swung on the other dog. I had it in the flashlight beam, but couldn't see it too well. It turned toward us, and my friend said that it had a face like that of an ape. It bounded into the trees, and the dogs were called off by him. We did not stay there that night. About six years ago, they had a program on TV that had recorded the noise believed to be a Bigfoot. It was the same sound completely that we heard. At the time of this, I was stationed at Travis Air Force Base in Fairfield, California. A year later, I was stationed there at Beale. After it was over and we were loading our gear, we heard the scream or yell again. Only further off, it was around 9.30 to 10 p.m. The weather was clear and cool. It was forested area, 
where we sat was a high hill-like place. Toward where we went to see it was downhill slightly into a small valley. On to the next one. I tell this story to anyone who's interested, but most people just laugh and don't believe me. I've known other bush pilots who say they've seen similar things, and my friend Pete was with me, and he saw it, so I know I'm not crazy. But I don't care what people think, because I know it's true, and I bet if I were to find all the people who have climbed Mount Foraker in the last 20 years or so, some of them would also know it's true, as well as some who have climbed Denali. I say this because, in retrospect, I'd heard rumors of this very thing, but had thought they were hallucinations from a lack of oxygen. But after talking to others, I think this creature actually lives in the Alaska Range. It makes you wonder what it might eat to survive in such an inhospitable place. Anyway, I was born and raised in Fairbanks. I'm one of those guys who flies tourists and mountaineers to Denali, also known as Mount McKinley. I fly out of one of the busiest airports in Alaska in the summer, even though it's not a very big place. If you've ever been to Talkeetna, you'll know where I'm talking about. Talkeetna is about two and one half hours north of Anchorage and just happens to be the town with the best flight access to Denali. It also has some of the best views of the mountain, which always surprises people as Denali is still a good hundred miles away. It's not a very big town with maybe a thousand people at most, but it certainly has its own distinct flavor. The town's mayor is a cat, and if you've ever watched the TV show Northern Exposure, it was modeled somewhat after Talkeetna. And, like I said, it has a very busy airport in the summer. In fact, I've wondered why there aren't any accidents with so many planes constantly coming and going. But I think it's because the bush pilots are such excellent flyers. They have to be, especially the ones that land on the glaciers, which is what I do. I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I do know how to get the job done. I should know after flying in the Alaska bush for over 30 years. If you come to Talkeetna in the summer and drive through town, you'll just think it's a typical busy little tourist town with an Alaskan flavor. But if you drive to the airport on the edge of town, you'll usually see a mob of people hanging around, waiting to go flight seeing or get shuttled to Denali. You'll also see a variety of types of planes, but the one I fly, the D. Halliman Turbo Beaver Ski Plane, is all set up for glacier landings with wheel skis. I typically do several types of flights. Tourists wanting to see Denali from the air, tourists wanting to land on a glacier, and mountaineers wanting a ride to Denali Base Camp. In any case, I tell people I have a job with a view. Oh, and there's a fourth type of flight, search and rescue. That's the one I dislike most because I hate the thought of someone needing rescuing. But it also often means flying at times I normally wouldn't fly, like when the weather's sketchy. But when someone's life is at stake, we push the limits. Okay, back to Denali, which is what we locals call it. You can find all kinds of information about the peak. It's like a rock star, since at 20,320 feet, it's the highest peak in North America. Its name is Athabascan, and one of the 11 different Athabascan languages here, seven have names for the mountain, and they all mean the high one. I guess you can probably tell I give flight tours, huh? These kinds of peaks, especially in the Alaska range, have a very high risk for climbers for altitude sickness, not to mention having extremely cold weather, 
because of their high latitude and proximity to jet streams. They take a lot of training and stamina to climb. Well, unless you're part Yeti anyway. Before you laugh, let me just say that I personally saw what appeared to be a Yeti or something like it on the Kalitna Glacier below Denali. And other people saw it too. And I hate to say it, but after all this happened, I thought back to some of the people who have gone missing in those mountains, especially the Denali area, and I think it's very possible that some thought up close and personal and didn't survive. When you're at Denali Base Camp, which is where we drop off climbers, you have a great view of Denali's neighbor, the 17,240-foot Mount Foraker even though the mountain's about 14 miles away. The Kalhitna Glacier runs between Foraker and Denali's base camp. You can see all along the glacier from base camp as it's actually on one fork of the glacier. The glacier is the longest glacier in the Alaska Range, and if I remember correctly, it's about 44 miles of crevasses and ice. Kalhitna is Athabascan for from the source, which refers to Denali. I mention this because of the two climbers I'm going to talk about actually climbed Foraker, then hiked most of the glacier and ended up at a remote bush fishing lodge. I would love to read the book if they ever write one, as Foraker's no easy climb, and I've never heard of anyone walking the glacier, and I think Kalhitna is where this creature hangs out. Just check out how many climbers have gone missing in that region. Okay, hopefully that's enough background information to get us going. Maybe too much. Anyway, it had been a very busy season, and I'd been flying people out of base camp several trips a day. I can take five people and their gear at once, and it takes about an hour to get to Talkeetna from base camp. I then have to help unload and fly back, so each trip takes at least three hours. You can fly really long hours in the summer in Alaska, as it's generally daylight about 20 out of 24 hours. It was mid-May, and the weather forecast called for a general deterioration with high winds which plagued Nolly. So, lots of climbers were making a scramble to get out. Well, I was getting tired, so it must have been getting late in the afternoon when I landed in Talkeetna, and I got the rescue message. I was doing a flight check when my buddy Pete, also a pilot, came out and told me that somebody needed rescue. I'm generally one of the first people they call for a search and rescue activities, as I have lots of experience, and I'm always ready and eager to go, tired or not. I get a real sense of accomplishment from helping save lives. I expected it would be something on Denali, maybe a broken leg or something, as that was where we did the majority of rescues. Instead, I was asked to fly over Foraker and see if I could spot two missing climbers. Apparently, a husband and wife climbing team were well beyond their return date. Their family was getting very anxious and had called for help. I got everything ready for another flight, which included some coffee and a sandwich, and was soon up in the air again. Pete would go along as a spotter. I think at that point, I was on my fourth flight up to the mountain. We were soon above Denali Base Camp, which also serves as the base camp for climbers attempting rescues on Hunter and Foraker. I tried to think back. Had I taken this couple to base camp earlier? I couldn't recall them at all, so odds were good I hadn't. Pete and I flew low over base camp, marveling, as I always do, at the colorful tents, then continued on toward the flank of Foraker. Pete said, Joe told me just before we left that some climbers at base camp said they saw two people walking way out there, going down the glacier. He pointed across the white expanse of ice towards Foraker. He had it. They were just hiking along, going the wrong direction from base camp. I'm wondering if they weren't our couple. Why would anyone want to walk down the glacier, I asked. 
expecting no answer, as it didn't make sense. I banked a few down the glacier while Pete used his powerful binoculars to scan below us. He said he saw nothing. I swung back around, again circling over base camp, gaining altitude, then heading to Foraker, Pete now scanning the higher slopes of the mountain. We did several circuits, Pete scoping it out as we went, making sure not to miss anything, but he still saw nothing. I felt fatigue set in, even though there was plenty of daylight left, and told dispatch we were coming back. I had done about all I could for one day, especially considering I hadn't gotten much sleep the night before, as my daughter Amanda was suffering from a bad toothache. My wife had taken her to the dentist this morning and had called to say she would be okay, but it had been a long night. Back at Talkeetna, I got a few more details, though nobody really seemed to know much other than that this couple was missing. Apparently, they were from Seattle and were veteran climbers. Their family had said their flight from Seattle had come in two days ago, and they hadn't been on it. There had been no communication with them since they had actually summited the peak where they'd called from a satellite phone, exuberant and happy, telling their family they were now going to start down. That had been several days before. I didn't sleep well that night again, as tired as I was thinking about this couple and where they might be. It wouldn't be unusual to fall into a crevasse, but generally, if you have two people, one can rescue the other. Climbers in the Alaskan range know you need good crevasse rescue techniques and generally stay roped together while crossing glaciers. The weather had been good for weeks, which was absolutely miraculous for the Alaska range, which was notorious for changing weather and high winds. This made it unlikely they would be sitting somewhere in a snow cave waiting out bad weather because there hadn't been any. The next day, I hauled another load of climbers out of base camp. But first, I did another circuit of Foraker. My friend Pete wasn't with me, so I had to fly while trying to spot, which isn't very effective and can be dangerous. I returned to Talkeetna, dumped off the climbers, then picked up Pete, and we headed back to Foraker. Once again, we circled the mountain several times at various altitudes, trying to hone in on anything unusual. I was about ready to head back when Pete suggested we fly a ways down the glacier again, just in case they'd become disoriented and were going the wrong way. We cruised straight down it, as low as I dared, until suddenly Pete grabbed my arm. Bjorn, there's something weird down there, right down on the edge of the glacier, over there. What are you looking at? I asked. Not sure, Pete answered, but I thought I saw some kind of movement. I swung the plane back around, straightened out, and again, skimming low over the glacier. Now, Pete was excited. There's somebody down there. They look to be walking out, but they're going the wrong way. They need to head toward base camp. That's pretty strange, I commented, swinging the plane around for a better view. I now flew in as low as possible and could finally see what Pete was talking about. Below, like colorful dots, were two figures dressed in red jackets. Upon seeing us, they frantically waved their arms, and I waggled my wings to show them we'd seen them. But there was nothing I could do. I couldn't land anywhere nearby, so I radioed headquarters what we'd seen, but Pete had an idea. So he wrote a note and put it in a sandwich baggie, along with a small rock and a piece of orange flagging. Like a lot of bush pilot, I always carry rocks for that purpose. It sounds funny, but you'd be amazed at how many times I've had to contact clients using this method to tell them I couldn't land because of winds, that kind of thing. People just aren't aware that there aren't that many cell towers out there, out in the Alaskan bush, and few can afford satellite phones. The note told them they were going the wrong way and had a little map showing them where to go. It also gave instructions to wave if they needed a rescue, and we'd send in a helicopter. I strongly suspected it was the husband and wife team from Seattle. 
they were several days overdue, and even though climbers will carry extra provisions, I suspected they had very little fuel or food left. At a certain point, fuel is more important than food, for without fuel, you can't melt drinking water. I circled back around, again, dropping the note, and they quickly ran over and picked it up. By then, I was pretty far past them, so I circled around yet again. They were frantically waving, so we knew they needed a rescue. I again waggled my wings and circled, but the pair didn't turn back toward base camp, but instead continued in the direction they'd been going. They seemed to be in a hurry, half jogging, working their way around massive blocks of ice and glacial debris. This is just weird, Pete said. Surely they can read my map. I thought it was pretty obvious. It was obvious, I replied. There must be something else going on. Pete answered. They act like they're running away from something. I'm going to circle again, I said. This time, the circle was wider, and Pete and I scanned the countryside, trying to understand why the couple weren't going in the correct direction. I suspected a crevasse had opened up or something was blocking their way. I had, in the meantime, radioed back to the Talkeetna airport with coordinates for a helicopter rescue. They said one would be in the air within moments, so I knew within an hour the chopper would be there to rescue them. It was imperative they get out before the winds picked up. Pete looked through the binoculars, now grabbed onto my arm. Holy smokes, he exclaimed. No wonder they're running. It appears they're being followed by a polar bear. No way, I answered. Polar bears are never found this far from the ocean. Even though they're bears, they're considered a marine animal. They never come inland like this. We're a long way from the Bering Sea. Look, Bjorn, just take a look real quick through these binoculars. I'll hold the stick. Pete pointed in the direction I should look. And as I held the binoculars up, it took a moment to find what he was looking at. When I did, I let out a long, low whistle. That thing is huge, I exclaimed, handing the binoculars back to Pete. Yeah, and it's running on its hind legs, which is hard for a bear to do. It looks like it's stalking them. No wonder they're running. The problem is that the further they get from help, the less likely they are to get away from the bear. We need to do something, I said. I banked the plane for yet another look, this time losing altitude until we were low over the glacier. But Pete had to tell me which way to go as the animal blended in so well that I couldn't fly and look for it at the same time. I bet you it's a hybrid between a brown and a polar bear, Pete said. I've heard of these, but I don't remember ever hearing they were white. What are you going to do, buzz it? That's exactly what I'm going to do, I replied. Maybe we can scare it off. Bank a little more to the left, Bjorn, then come in straight. Can you see it? I see it, I said, losing altitude until I was right over it. Holy smokes, Pete repeated. That's one giant bear. I could now see it quite well, and it was just a little ahead and below us. I kept losing altitude, buzzing it. As I did so, it stopped and turned and looked up at us. I pulled up, and as I did so, Pete said, Bjorn, that's the weirdest looking bear I've ever seen. It's absolutely huge. But its face? Well, its face just doesn't look right. I gained altitude and circled around again. Did I slow it down any? I asked. It's standing there, Pete replied. It's watching us. Man, I'd hate to be on the ground and have that thing around. I'm going to try to buzz it again, I replied. Once again, quickly losing altitude. If we can just stall it until the chopper gets here, that would be good. Can you see where the climbers are? No, Pete replied. As I buzzed it yet again, I got a good look at it. Just under my left wing. It was indeed huge. Its coat, a dull yellowish white, but it really didn't look much like a polar bear. It looked more like a football player with white fur. What the heck is that thing? Pete asked, then added, Geez, Bjorn, it looks like it has a human face. Could it be someone all in white, like in a white jumpsuit or something? I asked. 
No, Pete answered. It's too huge to be human. But Bjorn, I'm thinking we're not dealing with any polar bear. It reminds me of sketches I've seen of the Yeti over in the Himalayas. Once again, I gained altitude. I wanted to fly over the climbers and see where they were. I flew several circles thinking they had to be nearby, but they seemed to have disappeared. Pete, where the heck did it go? I asked. Oh, geez, Pete replied. This is crazy. They just disappeared. The way they were running, it's very possible they stepped into a crevasse without seeing it. It's nuts to just go running across a big glacier like the Kalhitna. You have to take your time, rope together, testing depressions where the snow might hide a crevasse, ready to rescue the other if need be. They must be really scared to ignore all that. Dang, I replied, then circled, going lower and lower, looking for a gaping hole in the ice, but seeing nothing. Is there any way we could get low enough to follow their tracks? Pete asked. No, I replied. Not with that kind of glare. It's too reflective. I now banked back around, looking for the strange creature that we'd seen. It, too, seemed to have disappeared. What the heck? I asked. Where could it have gone? It could be anywhere, Pete replied. With that white coat, all it would have to do is lay down with its face in the ground and it would blend in so well we would never see it again. We'd been circling for some time, and I knew the chopper would soon arrive. I had given them the coordinates of where we'd last seen the climbers, and I now flew back over the coordinates, but saw nothing. The vast expanse of glaciers stretched in all directions, and it just seemed impossible that anyone wearing bright red clothing could simply disappear, unless they had indeed fallen into a crevasse. I radioed back and told dispatchers what was going on, and that I needed to get back and was getting low on fuel. Pete and I headed back, and I thought I could see a helicopter in the distance. I hoped they would be able to find the climbers. A helicopter could hover really low and possibly follow their tracks. I called dispatch again and told them to give Gary, the chopper pilot, a message. Tell him to be careful if anyone gets out of the chopper as there's a possible bear nearby. A bear on the glacier? Sue the dispatcher asked. That's pretty unusual. Yes, what we are seeing is very unusual. I'll catch up with you later on that. Over. I decided to fly over the toe of the glacier looking for them one last time. There they are, Pete shouted. They made incredible time for glacier travel and seemed to be half hiding behind a large chunk of ice. I got their new coordinates and called it into dispatch. Then I had an idea. Pete, I have a shotgun behind the seat there. I'm going to try to drop it to them with some ammo. Get it ready, pack it inside my winter coat back there, and while you're at it, throw in my survival kit. The state of Alaska requires that bush pilots carry a survival kit, which includes a week's worth of rations, a pair of snowshoes, a sleeping bag, a wool blanket, and a signaling device such as smoke bombs, along with other survival gear. Pete wrapped it all up in a big bundle, with a shotgun in the middle. When he was ready, I swooped low over the couple, as he half stood on the seat and dropped it all from the plane's window. Airdrops aren't complicated, and Pete and I had both done lots of them. Primarily for fishing and hunting clients, the trickiest part is to not hit your own plane with the stuff and also be sure you maintain adequate airspeed while performing a low-level path, because if you don't, you're going to stall. I wasn't surprised when Pete dropped the stuff within 50 feet of them. They ran over and got it, and I pulled out, heading home. Hopefully, the chopper would soon pick them up, but... I didn't have enough fuel left to find out. Back at Talkeetna, I wrapped everything up for the day and went home. I wanted to see my daughter and make sure she was okay. Later, Pete called me to tell me the chopper hadn't been able to find the couple, which we both found very strange. You suppose the um bear thing was involved, I asked. Bjorn, you and I both know that wasn't no bear. I know, but Amanda's listening. What are you thinking it was? 
a bushman, Pete replied. Okay, but the main problem here is that, um, those things are black, not white, I noted. I know, but there could be a bushman adapted to the Arctic, Pete said. I was silent for a while. It was hard to comprehend, but I knew nature had some odd goings on. And who was I to pretend I had all the answers? Maybe it migrated over somehow from the Himalayas, I suggested. Pete replied, I read an article on the Yeti. Some British guy got a hold of some Yeti hair and did a DNA analysis. He said Yeti may be a rare polar bear species that's supposed to be extinct. What we saw wasn't a Yeti, Bjorn. It was a Bushman. Why would it be stalking him? I looked over to see if Amanda was listening, but she was busy playing with her new kitten. I don't know. Maybe it's hungry. But hopefully that shotgun will slow it down. I hope so, I answered, saying goodbye. The thought of a predatory bushman in my beloved mountains was a bit hard to stomach. I tried not to think much about it. The rescue chopper went out the next day, but never did find the climbers. It was a mystery as to what had happened to them until two weeks later, when the news came that they'd walked into the Chelatna Lake Lodge, exhausted and hungry. They'd hiked down the glacier and over to a nearby lake. It had been a bit of a hike, to say the least, but my survival kit had helped save their lives. I was sure, even though I never got the chance to talk to them. They were soon back in Seattle, reunited with their families. I never got my shotgun back, but how would they know who to return it to? I would never know if it had saved their lives, but somehow I suspected it had after that, I often flew clients into base camp via the Kalhitna Glacier, always watching and wondering if the Bushman was down there. I never saw it again, and I will say that I was happy enough with that. On to the next one. In the Goat Rock Wilderness in Lewis in Yakima County in Washington, a hunter was hunting alone when he heard footsteps and prepared to take aim at a deer. Instead, he saw a large dark form standing upright before him. The creature had lighter colored palms and face compared to its body and watched the hunter for a moment before going into the brush. On to the next one. Near Graham, in Pierce County in Washington, Bill Belvick of Graham, alone with Paul Willis, Scott Martin, and Milo Rogers, camped about five miles north of Windy Pass on Mount St. Helen. While walking around at night, they found, on a steep pumice slope, 30 to 50 footprints that were 18 inches long, sinking about three inches down compared to their own one inch. They took pictures. The stride was four to five feet. Where they found it was tough to walk. On to the next one. Two mushroom pickers in Mason County in Washington reported seeing a shiny metallic cigar-shaped craft descending and hover close to the ground. A purple elevator-type object was descended from the bottom of the object and from it a huge, hairy, man-like creature emerged. It was carrying something resembling a wooden plank. It crossed a meadow and entered the woods, but soon returned to the object, which then shot away, emitting a loud, roaring sound. On to the next one. This was near Beulet Path, in Chelan County in Washington. We were hiking toward the west on a 45-degree slope of forest soil when we came upon four large prints. They ran from west to east towards the direction we had been coming from, above the easternmost track. There was a fifth print that was the best to view. These two prints had been created by a biped who put most of their weight on the lower downhill leg while placing only a small amount of weight on the uphill leg. As a result, the lower footprint had slipped about eight inches down the slope 
tearing the slope to the wet clay beneath. The upper track was 16 inches long and over 4 inches wide. The track that had exposed the wet ground was less than 10 minutes old when we found it since it dried before our eyes to form a dry crust. My husband Mark tried to duplicate the track's depth and appearance by stomping his hiking boot into the ground. It required five such kicks. The main line of tracks were spaced at over four feet apart. When Mark tried to duplicate this same stride length, he fell because the slope was 45 degrees. Above the fifth track, there appeared to be toe kick imprint made as the subject tried to go directly up the slope. The track vanished in an area covered with deep pine needles. We followed the general direction of the print uphill until we came to a large nest. The nest was next to a pine out on the uphill side. This was about three to three and a half feet high, made of pine needles, and was shaped sort of like a volcano with a hole at the top. The hole was about two to three feet wide. We took pictures of the best track and the nest. Over a decade later, we were watching a special about China on PBS that showed what was supposed to be the nest of a Chinese version of Bigfoot. It looked just like ours had, except the one in China was made of twigs. It appears that the subject was moving our direction, then stopped to view us. It then climbed up over the slope toward the nest site for whatever reason. This occurred at 10 to 11 a.m., on to the next one. This was in Thurston County in Washington. I was at the edge of a field about a mile down the road from my grandparents' house. I had ridden my motorcycle down to a small pond by the edge of the road, where I was looking to see if I could find any frogs or salamanders. I was walking slowly around the pond again and again. I heard a loud cracking sound coming from the tree line on the other side of the field, about 100 yards away. I turned to see, very quickly, a very large, dark brown, shaggy form tearing down a branch as it turned and almost instantly disappeared into the tree line. The creature I saw was on the other side of a mound, so I could not see its legs, but it looked to be around seven feet tall. I had a strange feeling of being watched. However, I did not have the sense of being threatened, though I did get the feeling that it wanted me to know it was there, as it was likely watching me for some time before breaking down the branch. I decided to get on my motorcycle and head for the house. I was 12 or 13 and really didn't want to look into something that was that large. At other times, I've smelled a rotten, stench coming from the swampy area, but usually I take the logical explanation and think that it was a dead, rotting animal of some kind. I was quietly walking around a pond looking for frogs. This took place sometime in the afternoon. I was by a pond at the north end of an open field, just by the roadway. The creature was on the south side of the field, just in the tree line of a dense forest. There is a swamp to the west of this field, and the Deschutes River is just a few hundred feet south of where the creature had been. On to the next one. I had gone hiking in the Alpine Lake Wilderness Area in Washington. The trailhead is at the end of West Fork Foss River Road. The snow had remained for several weeks longer than normal, and I had to use an ice axe in a couple of places to reach Copper Lake. I stayed there only long enough to boil some water for tea, and then took the trail back down to Trout Lake and onto the trailhead. I got in the car and started back down toward U.S. Highway 2. I had gone about half a mile, and on rounding a bend in the road, I saw a tall, dark creature crossed the road about 50 yards in front of me. I judged it to be about 8 feet tall, and it was definitely of a human-like body shape. I have often observed bears, and this was no bear. Bears do not cross the road on their hind legs, 
and, although they may rear up at times, I never got a look at its face, as it was turned away from me. After crossing the road, it went up a bank that was so steep, no human could have climbed it without traveling on all fours, and it remained upright. This was a creature such as I had never seen before, nor since. It was early afternoon, maybe 2 p.m., with bright sun and warm in the 70s. It was on an open road, brushy on both sides, with deep bank below road, some above with small trees intermixed. On to the next one. I took up fly fishing about three years ago. One of my favorite spots to fish was where the Claiborne Creek runs into the McLeod River in Northern California, but not anymore. Not since I ran into Bigfoot there. My encounter and sighting actually lasted nearly 15 minutes or so. I know that is a long time to be around such an enormous and scary animal or creature, but that is what happened. Here is my encounter, and if I were you, I would always bring a gun or at least bear spray when you go fishing in the woods of Northern California. I know I do today. I am a longtime California resident, Northern California for sure. I have fished every lake, river, creek, and stream from the Nevada border to the coastline. Of all that time out in the woods, fishing or camping, I never saw anything like I had that day near the McLeod River. Actually, I was fishing down a creek called the Claiborne, and while I will get into the sighting and experience in just a moment, I do want you to know a little bit about the surrounding fear and the fact that up until that day, I never really believed in the Bigfoot thing. Up until that day, I had never even found a footprint or felt weird or uncomfortable out and about fishing, or camping anywhere, and that includes growing up in Wisconsin before I moved out here to Northern California. The area, if you are familiar with here, you'd know, is mountainous and full of low-lying hills as well. They are also rather steep in some places. It is all but cliff around the part of the river and creek. I was at that day. However, there are some decent, more level areas along the edge of the river and along the creek, well, trails, and beach area that lead back and forth from the river more like it. That day, I decided to hike on up the creek about 100 yards or so. There were some large areas that seemed more like pools you would find in the river. However, this was a creek, and the fishing had always been great there at that time of year. The forest on both sides ran up steep hills and mountainsides, thick with tall brushes and pine trees of every kind, stood limb to limb, all of this creating darkness, 30 to 40 yards, in that was all but impenetrable for light. That morning was great. It was warm already, partly cloudy, but no rain was called for. It would be a morning of great fishing. The plan was to be out there all day, and into the early evening, I unpacked the car of all my fishing gear and large backpack full of food and water. And yes, I brought a few beers to stick in the cold water and drink throughout the day. I know some of you might think that bad, but come on, it is just a few beers. It was a longer walk than I was used to or remember. Maybe it was all the extra stuff I was carrying that made it a longer and more arduous than usual either way. I was tired by the time I got to the larger pools, but that was not going to stop me from getting to fishing. The morning started off great, actually. It was warm, like I said, and I was already up three fish caught and thrown back. Most of my day would be mostly catch and release, but of course, if I caught Walter, I would string him up. The weather was quiet on this part of the creek, and because I was still near the river, it was almost like a small river itself, instead of some creek that was decided upon. But the water was not loud and rushing. It was all rather quiet, well, until I heard what I thought were coyotes at first. It came up the creek. It sounded like it had to be at least a couple of hundred yards away, or possibly more. But then again, 
this was on a canyon-like area, though it could have been closer. It was like a whine of a coyote, not quite the call or howl of one, but more like a whining cry of one. So that is what I believed it to be. A coyote acting like a coyote, I suppose. But I was wrong, dead wrong. After about a few minutes of the whining, it stopped. Everything went back to normal. I even for a moment thought that the birds were chirping again. Weird, I never noticed it at first, at the time, but even they were quiet when the noise was going on. I was not scared, though not at that point. Like I said, I've spent a lot of time outdoors, and when I camp, sometimes I do not bring a tent, just a sleeping bag, cooking supplies, gun, and a fishing pole. My wife thinks I'm crazy for doing it, but I like roughing it, really roughing it. And just so you know, since I've not mentioned it, we have no kids, my wife and I. Well, she was unable, and our income level kept us from adopting. So it was just me out there that day, and usually camping as well as my wife is more of a homebody. I went back to fishing, and for about another hour, it was great once again. The fish were biting, the first beer was great, and the rain was not to be that day. But an hour later, things became quiet once again. This time, I was aware of the absence of the sound of birds, chipmunks, and other small and well-known critters of the forest around here. It was at this point that my mind had been changed on the subject of Bigfoot. They do exist. That day, the unbelievable and unknowable became known. Like I said, the side of the creek I was on was a rather flat area with deep hillsides about 30 yards behind me. As a matter of fact, because of flooding from time to time, the area I was in was also all but void of brush or standing trees. It was just low brush and deadfall. Of course, I could see across to the side of the hill, but beyond that was thick Pacific Northwest forest. As a matter of fact, this whole area is surrounded by the Modoc Fixes, Lathan and Shasta Trinity National Forest. It is thick vegetation here. So visibility into and up the hillsides was almost impossible. I could see about 20 or so yards in, but that was it. And when the cloud would pass in front of the sun, well, it was pitch black inside and visibility was nil. It started with a whoop sound. I have since this time read and heard recordings of and have come to believe it is both a communication practice between them and a possible warning to us people that they are present. But that last part is my best guess. I looked over my shoulder and again from the right and up the hill I heard another whoop. This time the sound was louder and I could tell it was directed at me. I don't know why it did but it just seemed like it. I sat my fishing pole down, took a few steps to the right as well, and that is when I noticed the movement as the sun shined down onto the fourth floor. Whatever it was seemed to have moved behind some brush and trees, but I did see it move. I could not at this point tell what it was. Personally, I was thinking elk or deer, maybe a small black bear, but I did not know. I only saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I picked up my fishing pole and decided I would get back to fishing. But at that moment, I heard a, well, grunt of some kind. Bear? Coyote? Was it a mountain lion? Whatever it was made a grunt, and I was not familiar with any known animal out here. That grunt other than bear, perhaps. However, this grunt came down off the hillside, and once again, I felt as though it was directed at me. The hair on my neck started to stand on end at that point, and an uncomfortable feeling started to come over me. While I hated the fact it was time to go, I might as well be safe than sorry. Besides, I could drive a few miles down the river and fish somewhere else. It took me about 10 or so minutes to get everything packed up and ready to go, and during that time, I heard another grunt sound coming from the hillside. The clouds had passed over, and this time I could not see a darn thing past a few yards or so into the woods up there. 
I had at least 200 yards to walk out of here, the river, and another 50 yards to my car from there. Although I was packed a bit heavier that day, for the most part at least, I began moving quickly along the trail easily enough. The only problem was getting started had put me closer to where the grunge came from than I would have liked. But hair on my neck or not, I had to go. I ended up getting around a small bend, putting that section behind me quickly, and before me was a pretty straight stretch leading to the river. However, the next thing I knew, I noticed movement again, out of the corner of my eye, just up the hillside in the trees. I stopped for a moment to look, and that is when I saw a large, dark brown figure walk, and I mean bipedal walking from one large tree to behind some others and rocky outcrop. My heart almost exploded. That was not a person. That was a giant animal, a monster, whatever, walking and literally paralleling me. At that moment, another grunt came from whatever that thing was. This time, however, it was followed by a seriously creepy growl. I started moving faster now. Not fast enough to set this thing off, hopefully, but enough to get me back to the river faster. At least there, I could dive in the river if need be and get away faster in the current. My mind was spinning as I walked on. Bigfoot? That kept playing in my mind. This thing was massive, walked on two legs I could see, and it was covered in dark brown hair. It was minutes later that my conclusion about what it was would be found to be correct. I kept walking, and as I did, I could hear the thing above me, about 30 to 40 yards at most, also walking or more like crashing through the woods, still paralleling me. I picked up the pace. I could see the river, although it was still about 50 yards out. I could see it nonetheless. All I had to do now was get around one more bend. This would put me closer to the thing following me, but there was no other way. There was too much debris, low brush, and rocks to walk closer to the creek. It would slow me down, actually. I was now close to the tree line at that point, and that is when the second scariest part of my trek back would happen. The scream must have been about 40 yards away, but it felt like it was right in front of me. It sounded like 20 wolves growling at the same time. I felt the vibrations move through me so hard, so violently, that I almost tripped and fell. I kept my footing, though barely. I stopped, caught my breath, and looked back up toward the trees. Once again, the figure ran with great speed from one tree to another. It also looked as though it was coming closer to me, like it was going to cut me off before the river. I started moving even faster, and before I knew it, I noticed movement not 20 yards away. I stopped in my tracks, and so did it. I looked to the left, only to see something I had no idea or reference for, Bigfoot. It was dark brown, darker than I thought earlier. It was not fur either. It was like long hair. I could hear it breathing from that close. It was taking in and letting out deep and raspy breath. Its face is what caught me off guard, as well as the fact that it had breath. I was staring at something that looked like a creature I had seen on a film once. One made not too far away from here, the Patty film. It looked just like that. However, I was seeing this thing without the blur and shaking, well, other than my hands at that moment. I remember its eyes. Its eyes were not beady, as I've heard some state. As a matter of fact, they had almost a human quality to them, and I could make out that they had whites to them. They were large, human-like, and I could sense they were, well, by the way they were set, she was angry, mad, or ready to eat me. I stopped looking at her, this beast of a thing, and started walking again. However, I kept my eyes to the ground and my ears wide open. I could still hear her following me, although she never seemed to come any closer than that moment we looked at each other. She grunted, she whooped some more, and as I finally reached the river and a larger patch, she let out another scream that had me chilled to the bone and it was warm that morning. I looked back over my shoulder one more time, as I noticed the walking, or better yet, the paralleling of me by this Bigfoot had stopped. She was still standing there, 
not in the open, but halfway behind a tree. I did not stare this time, but I did see her one last time. I turned down the larger trail and out of sight. I have never, ever been that frightened in my life. And trust me, I have been in some hairy situations, no pun intended, in the Middle East while serving in the military. I do not wander up the Claiborne Creek like I used to. Then again, I am older now, and that hike is just a little too much for me anyway. However, I did want to share my story, as I never hear people talk much about seeing female Bigfoot. I still think about that face today, and, to be honest, it makes me shudder. A bit to know that these animals are out here, in the woods, all around us, and we don't even know it. I'm not scared or frightened enough to not go fishing today, and up the McLeod River, I just don't go there to Claiborne ever. On to the next one. A soldier at Fort Knox Army Base in Hardin County reported encountering a tall, dark-haired Bigfoot. It was humanoid, but unlike anything the witness had ever seen before. No official explanation regarding the intruder's identity was forthcoming. Just days after his uncle claimed to have had an encounter with a hair-covered, man-like creature near Vine Grove, Kentucky, in early July of 2009, David saw strange, animalistic eyes that looked like they were glowing in the dark. One evening, after he stepped outside to see why his dogs were barking, he was able to watch the glowing eyes for several minutes. He later claimed, before they disappeared into the darkness of the night, he felt strongly that the eyes belonged to the creature his uncle had previously seen, whatever that might be. He never saw the creature, just the eyes, but felt that he should report the event. On to the next one. I was contacted by a rural family from Horse Cave, Kentucky, who described to me a curious one-car accident in 2001, which resulted in one human fatality. The residents felt that the fatality resulted from a collision with a Bigfoot. The entire family maintained that the public was kept away from the scene of the nighttime collision, but these particular residents lived nearby and were able to approach the scene of the wreck by walking through the woods. From the woods, they observed the authorities burying something beside the road, grubbing the pavement to remove copious amounts of blood and taking extraordinary measures to keep the public away from the scene. The family had several sightings to relate on and around their isolated rural homestead. The wreck that they described was in an area of much prior Bigfoot activity. They called the area of the wreck just off Highway 218 Bigfoot Hill. It was walking distance from their house. After the wreck and the mysterious burial, they heard loud, mournful wails coming from the area for many nights. The residents were therefore very leery of visiting the location, not out of concern for the fact that the creatures were still around, but for fear of being observed by locals who would wonder what they were after. Apparently, the mayor, who was also the undertaker, lived within sight of the location of the wreck. They sent me a detailed map to the location, and I considered relaying it to a local investigator. Instead, I convinced the residents to try to investigate the matter more completely by themselves. Perhaps under cover of darkness, they could probe the ground for an indication of what type of remains, if any, lay beneath the disturbed earth beside the road at the scene of the wreck. Eventually, they were able to do just that, and they phoned me later with the news that the earth appeared to have been once again disturbed. The soil had an intensely putrid smell, but no identifiable remains could be found. I must say that after following up on plenty of such reports in the past, I was not at all surprised by this news. Par for the course, really. While it was regrettable that the residents didn't get around to the probing sooner, such is generally the case. By the time such tantalizing reports reach us, it is generally too late to utilize the information, 
even if it was accurate in the first place. But the credibility of the family was better than most situations. They lived near mammoth caves, where many unmapped caves provide potential safe havens for any manner of reclusive creature. The woman was a reverend, and the different members of the family were in complete agreement about the details of the various events that they witnessed. The family reported that they began to experience substantial hostility directed at them from unknown sources. Their property was vandalized. Someone tried to run them off the road. Someone tried to run over their son. Their landlord wanted to evict them. Finally, they decided to move to another state. Threats, persecution, and even attempted murder by government officials. Why? On to the next one. Few places can compare to Henderson County when it comes to hairy humanoid activity. Indeed, unexplained phenomena in general. We must linger here for a time to truly appreciate the scope of the hairy humanoid situation in this region of the Bluegrass State. Henderson is truly a magical and mysterious place. I was born and raised here along the banks of the Ohio and Green Rivers, and there I've been fortunate enough to witness a variety of astounding sights and experiences relating to the unexplained. This is not, in my opinion, because I'm special in some way or an anomalies magnet, but merely because I've lived nearly my entire life in and around the places in which these enigmas tend to appear or manifest themselves. Large, hairy wild men certainly are no strangers to my home county. Indeed, it appears that they have made for themselves a permanent home there. I've personally spoken to witnesses of Henderson County monster activity from as far back as 1935, but I'm sure they stretch much further back in time though poorly reported or documented, nor are they strangers to me. Again, this is mainly due to the bottomland locations in which I lived. Watershed areas, I've come to understand, are like Bigfoot roadways, which they use mainly under the cover of darkness. In 1971, when I was five years old, my family lived in Reed, Kentucky, at a place we called Booth's Farm on Collins Road. One night, as we sat watching TV, my older sister glanced out the kitchen window and saw a monster looking back at her. She screamed very loudly. My father, shotgun in hand, rushed out with my mother behind him and fired two shots at a tall brown figure as it was running down a dirt road, which led to the back fields. When my dad asked my sister what it had looked like, she said Frankenstein. But... It was known thereafter as the Brown Man. The location, as it turns out, is a very active one regarding monster activity with sightings dating back to the 1960s and continuing on to the present. In 1968, another, or possibly the same creature, was seen there by the previous family by the name of Driscoll, and giant five-toed footprints were found. We were forced to move after my mother saw a red-colored UFO land out behind one of the old barns late one evening. After a brief stay in the city, we moved to Spotville in 1975, where my family endured a terrifying 11-month ordeal with a group of large, hairy bipedal monsters with a penchant for causing terror and killing livestock. We spent the next 10 years living in the city, away from the easy country life, but returned to Reed in 1985. All hell broke loose here, as this stately, old two-story home on Carlinsburg Road was haunted on the inside as well as out. While UFOs routinely buzzed overhead and black panthers roamed in the woods beyond our yard, Bigfoot put in a few appearances as well. My former brother-in-law, while driving down Ohio River Road No. 2 in broad daylight, saw what he at first thought took to be a deer standing alongside the road. Then it stood up on two legs and ran off into the thick brush. It was six or seven feet tall, he said, covered in brown hair and very fast. A similarly described beast 
this one with glowing green eyes, approached my four-year-old daughter, her mother, and my sister one evening as they were gathering clothes off the line. The two grown women were so frightened that they ran off and left the child standing at the clothesline. My sister rushed back, grabbed her under one arm, and rushed into the house where they immediately closed and locked all the doors and windows. Unfortunately, I happened to be away that night practicing for an upcoming musical engagement. Around midnight one evening, the entire family was awakened by a thunderous crashing sound that thoroughly shook the entire house. It was so loud that we actually thought that someone had lost control of their vehicle and crashed it into the house. It was strange that the three dogs we had didn't bark a single time. We looked out the window but saw nothing, heard nothing. There was no vehicle. My father insisted that no one go outside until morning when we found the garage door ripped off its metal tracks and lying on the garage floor. While artifact hunting alone in the bottoms one day, I came across a trail of immense footprint crossing a muddy field. The mud was a foot deep, so I could make no positive identification of them, but the creature that made them walked on two feet and had an extremely lengthy stride, which I was completely unable to match. On another occasion, my stepmother was out in the barn checking on one of the dogs that was being kept there when the dog suddenly began howling in misery. Seconds later, something growling and making the weirdest noises entered the open bottom level of the barn beneath her feet. The sound made the hairs on the back of her neck stand up, she later told me. And then, whatever this thing was, began walking around the barn and coming her way. She was terrified beyond words, which was totally out of character for her. So much so that she actually climbed into the pen with the dog and hid her face as this thing approached. She remained this way until the thing eventually wandered away. Even though she didn't see it, she said she could tell that whatever it was walked on two legs. In 1989, after repeated sightings of Black Panthers, she'd had enough and moved out shortly afterward. In 1999, while driving down Highway 60 one afternoon in Basket, Kentucky, I happened to look over to a bean field on my left and was surprised to see two large, hairy creatures standing in the beans about 10 feet from the top edge of the field. Both were brownish-gray in color and were positioned with their backs toward me. One was squatting down, apparently doing something to the ground or digging around in the beans which were tall enough to obscure whatever its hands were doing. Both of these creatures were very big, at least six or seven feet tall, and since the highway was full of the afternoon traffic coming home from work, I'm sure that the other motorists must have seen these things as well. If this is so, however, it seems that none of them felt particularly inclined to come forward. It is interesting to note that all these locations are within 10 miles of each other and are routinely the locations in which all manner of mysterious phenomena are experienced. These places also have a few things in common, chiefly being that they are all within a stone's throw of either the Green or Ohio rivers and they are littered with the burial mounds left centuries ago by Native Americans. Make of that what you will. Back in the early 1980s, 10-year-old Billy G, while playing alone in the woods in Corydon, Kentucky, also Henderson County, was interrupted by a huge bipedal ape-like creature with long arms as it walked across a nearby field toward him. Its body was muscular and completely covered in dark hair. He was so scared that he froze for a few seconds before finally managing to squat down behind some trees until the thing walked past him. He later told me what struck him most was the immense thickness of this thing's legs, like tree trunks. When it had disappeared into the distance, he ran all the way back to his house and never played alone in the area again. On to the next one. Hello, friends. My name is Matthew, 
and my story takes place in the rural town of Claremont, Wyoming. I was 26 years old. I worked as a bartender four nights per week, and because of this, I was fortunate enough to be presented with lots of interesting opportunities. If you're looking for a way to really get to know the locals where you live, spend some time bartending. You'll see what I mean. I met this middle-aged woman who I'll give the alias of Mandy. Mandy would come in from time to time and would be very flirtatious. She would also often talk about how her husband passed away a few years earlier and that her ranch home was far too big for the likes of her. I don't believe her place in Wyoming was her primary home as she seemed to be away for well over half the year. One time she asked me about where I was living and I told her about my tiny one bedroom apartment. She was pretty drunk at the time and made a big deal about it. She demanded that I move into her guest house. As soon as she told me it would be rent free, I happily accepted the offer. The only duty I had while living there was to look after her cats when she was away. It seemed as though she had fired the last person to have had that responsibility just so that she could justify my move over there. I'll admit, Mandy was a bit creepy at times, but I dealt with it. It was an easy enough price to pay for no longer having the burden of worrying about making rent every month. Still, I got the impression she might have been abusing alcohol along with other harmful substances, and this sometimes made her belligerent. She did seem kind of lonely, so I suppose I felt like I was doing at least a little bit of a good deed by socializing with her. I don't think even a week had gone by since I moved in over there when I stumbled upon something incredibly odd. The yard of her property was rather spacious, and when looking in pretty much any direction, you could find a trail or at least a clearing in the woods. It was a late summer day when I decided to go for a walk that I'd never forget. I remember I was listening to a podcast and admiring the scenery, heading deeper and deeper into the woods, trying to become more acclimated to my new environment. Eventually, I made it over to what was essentially a valley in the middle of the forest. Though there were fewer trees in this valley, then there were in the rest of the surrounding forest, there were still enough to give it lots of shade and keep it hidden from hovering air traffic. There was something about this area that immediately caught my attention. There were structures made of branches, leaves, and moss scattered throughout the terrain. Although I didn't walk right up to them or anything, they were all large enough for multiple humans to fit comfortably inside. I came across this area around late morning. I knew that because I remember that I had just had a cup of bulletproof coffee, which was a late morning ritual for me for years. At that time, I had no clue as to what I was looking at. I probably assumed it was a project done by the local Boy Scouts or something like that. What I did know was that I had an awful feeling while standing there, and I felt like many sets of eyes were on me, even though I was unable to see a single soul. There was no noise of any kind. In fact, it was so unusually silent that I could hear the sound of my increased heart rate. However, shortly after that, I was disturbed by the sound of footsteps coming from somewhere behind me. When I turned around, I couldn't believe what I saw. A large elk with about half of its skin torn off slowly hobbled past me about 50 yards in the distance. But that wasn't even the most shocking part of it. What followed behind the severely injured elk was what, at first, looked like a couple of gorillas. They were both very dark and moved across the forest on both their back feet and their knuckles. They seemed to be maintaining a distance as they observed the wounded animal, waiting for it to die. I was so frightened by the sight that I turned and ran as fast as I could back to the guest house. 
Every so often, I would look over my shoulder, but fortunately, it seemed that nothing was interested in following me. I don't know what those things were, or if they were affiliated with those tree structures, but they scared the daylights out of me. I've read a lot of material on the topic, and I think it's safe to assume that what I saw were a couple of Sasquatch. I didn't tell the homeowner about what I saw that day, mainly because I didn't want her to think she was renting the guest house to a nutcase. I did live at that place for a considerable amount of time, but never again saw Sasquatch. There were times in the middle of the night where I heard strange noises, but I can't say whether they were affiliated. Thanks for allowing me to share my story. On to the next one. I want to start by saying I used to be a very closed-minded individual. I truly was the last person to believe that the government would be covering up all sorts of things from the public, especially when it comes to the topic of cryptids. I now know that there is so much more to this life than we are told. Don't get me wrong. At first, I had a really hard time accepting this fact, but when I included meditation into my daily life, I started to find the idea to be rather liberating. I guess you could say that I started to see it as a reminder that nothing we think we know is set in stone. When you think about it, that can have a way of stripping away many limitations, especially when it comes to our perceptions of what is around us. Let me tell you, the Sasquatch species is very, very real. My Sasquatch sighting took place just outside of Ashland, Oregon. My husband and I were on our fourth anniversary back in 2002. We were both very passionate about camping, so it had become a tradition to do it during our anniversary celebration. But we also really wanted to see Ashland, so we took this as an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. It was the first night that we were there at the secluded campsite that we decided to go for a nighttime walk over to the nearest lake. And it was one of those nights where the stars were super visible. And even though it was quite chilly, we felt that we had to take advantage of the opportunity. We brought a fleece blanket with us and spread it out across a hill that gave us a great view of both the lake and the night sky. We must have been lying there for almost an hour when we saw a group of about six dark figures walking near the edge of the water. They were probably about 100 yards away from us, and I could only make out the silhouettes, not too much detail. Both my husband and I were silent as we spectated, mainly because we were so stupefied by what we were looking at. It was as though our brains could not derive an explanation. Was it a group of very large men? If it was, these men were strolling around the perimeter of the lake in very odd ways. I wouldn't go as far as to say that we felt threatened by whatever these things were. However, both my husband and I were reluctant to speak a word while these beings were nearby. I must have observed them for around five minutes when my husband began gently poking me and gesturing that we should slowly and quietly head out of the area and back toward our camp. I could tell by his body language that he had a bad feeling, and I'm fairly certain that it was his trepidation that made me feel a similar unease. When we stood up and started walking out of the area, and I turned around about a minute later, I noticed that two of the figures were much, much closer to us. I couldn't help but gasp as it was very clear that they were analyzing us, likely evaluating whether we were enemies or prey. I would estimate that they were standing about 30 yards away from us, and every bone in my body warned me not to make any sudden movements that could be mistaken for aggression. The closer that these creatures were, the creepier they looked. Their body proportions were somewhere in between a man and an ape. 
Even though I still couldn't see a lot of detail, I felt as though we were looking at wild people of the forest. One of them started mumbling some very peculiar language to the other one, but to us, it sounded like nothing more than gibberish. I could see the strange lips moving in a variety of weird ways, displaying a distinct form. I became more and more frightened by the second, as it seemed to me that they were discussing whether or not they should eat us. Even if they didn't want to consume us, I still felt as though they were questioning whether they should kill us or not. It felt like they were displeased that we had seen them, like we had learned a secret we weren't supposed to know. Both of them were sniffing the air. It reminded me a lot of what dogs do when they're meeting someone for the first time. Even though it was so dark outside, I could see the massive nostrils as they opened and closed with every sniff. I have no idea what prompted him to do it, but out of nowhere, my husband switched on his flashlight and shined it in their faces. That immediately disturbed them, and they both hissed like a couple of cats. I don't know if it was because of the light, but both sets of eyes looked so bright white. It was like they didn't have pupils. Of course, I only got a glimpse of them because they turned and moved away from the light after they hissed. As my husband continued to shine the flashlight in their direction, I could see the other figures had stayed back by the water's edge. However, it looked like they were standing on two legs and trying to decide whether they should join the two who were closest to us. I guess I was so stunned by what I was looking at that I hadn't even realized my husband was whispering for us to start moving. My husband kept the flashlight pointed toward them as we proceeded to slowly back away from the area and get back onto the path that led to our campsite. The creatures began matching our pace. It felt like any second until they were going to attack. I was clutching my husband's hand so tightly, and I could feel how sweaty his palms were. When we made it back to the path, the creatures had stopped following us so closely. It seemed to me they just wanted to escort us out of the area. Maybe they had some babies nearby and were worried that we might find them or something. The two of us were so incredibly spooked that we saw no other way to carry on with the night other than to throw our stuff in the vehicle and head out of there, far, far away from there. I found it strange how quiet we were in the car ride home, but I guess it does make some sense that we would be too shocked to have any worthwhile conversation at that moment. The next day was completely different. We walked to our usual cafe, grabbed a few coffees, and had a long chat trying to decide if what we thought had happened really did happen. We did an interesting experiment. As opposed to talking about the details of how the creatures appeared, we instead decided to write it down on paper and then hand each other our pieces of paper. Our visuals of these creatures were nearly identical, making it very clear that neither of us had imagined anything at all. They looked like a combination of apes and professional bodybuilders. Even in the dark, you could see muscle definition behind the hair. Their heads seemed to protrude from their upper chest rather than from any visible neck. Of course, I have no way of knowing for sure, but I got a distinct impression that these things were meat eaters. I don't know how it could be possible to have that much muscle mass without consuming meat regularly. I bet they have a very similar diet to grizzly bears, likely eating whatever nutrients they can get their hands on. And I'll be willing to bet that food isn't all that scarce to them. It gives me chills to wonder whether they've eaten any humans that have gone missing in the woods. With all the people that do go missing on an annual basis, I do get the feeling that these things are to blame for at least some of the disappearances. By no means am I saying we should find them and gun them all down. It's just that after running into these creatures, I think it's considerate to warn everyone to exercise extreme caution when stepping into the woods 
especially when alone. Seriously, I can't imagine ever going into the wild by myself now. On to the next one. My uncle has a cabin in Northern California, up in the Cascades, about 10 miles south of Mount Shasta. It's up a dirt road, TV road, or microwave road, or something like that. It's in the middle of nowhere, or really in the middle of a forest. I used to go up there when I was a kid, and well into my teen years. I loved it. I have many fond memories of that forest. I used to laugh at the people who went on vacations to fancy resorts. How is it a vacation with all those other people surrounding you? Up in the woods, you can really get away from the crowds and all the hassles of civilization. A couple of years ago, my grandma called me and asked if I'd like to go up to the cabin for a week. Apparently, my uncle needed to go into the hospital for an operation. Nothing big, no need to worry. He wanted someone to go out to the cabin to look after it, along with his dog. Well, I was in college, and it was summer break, so yeah, I jumped at the idea. I asked Grandma if I could bring a friend with me, and she hemmed and hawed a bit until I told her it was another girl from my class. She was fine with that. I think she was worried I'd be bringing a boy up for a fun weekend. She's a bit old-fashioned like that. Carol and I flew into Sacramento in the morning, and Grandma picked us up. Now, my Grandma may be a bit old-fashioned about something, but she does love to drive fast. We were up at that cabin in time for lunch, and that counts, stopping at Trader Joe's in Reading for supplies. The cabin was pretty much as I remembered it, a two-story blue wooden building in a clearing just off the road. It had a wraparound porch and an old metal garage off to one side. Carol, who'd never been out of a big city in her life, seemed a bit nonplussed. But she'd been like that ever since we turned up the dirt road. Come on, I said. It's great inside. I was about to drag her inside when Grandma harumphed us. A bit shamefaced, Carol and I grabbed the supplies. Carol was still looking at the cabin a bit skeptically, but her face brightened when we got inside. My uncle always said, it's not what's on the outside that matters. When it came to his cabin, he practiced what he preached. Once you got inside, you realized what he meant. The living room has all leather furniture and polished wood. The kitchen is really modern. The TVs take up half the walls in most rooms. Carol brightened up a lot once she saw the inside. I guess she'd been thinking we'd be roughing it. Barney was happy to see us too. He's my uncle's dog. He's an old black Labrador. I have no idea how old. He doesn't move that fast anymore, but his tail still wagged at full speed when we untied him from the back porch and let him inside. My uncle says he has to stay off the furniture, but my uncle wasn't there, was he? Your uncle's redecorating the bedrooms, Grandma said, giving the dog on the sofa an evil look. You two will have to sleep in his room. It's the only one that's livable right now. I remembered my uncle's room. It was the one at the south end of the cabin, facing the woods at their thicket. I grabbed Carol's hand and pulled her upstairs. Ta-da, I said, swinging the door open. The room was much as I remembered it. It was all wood paneling, a deer's head mounted over the dresser, and a huge iron bedstead with a big, soft, fluffy mattress. Then I looked up at the windows. They'd been changed. The old wooden frames replaced by new aluminum ones. The windows seemed to have been repositioned slightly. Where the big old window looked south had been, there was now a smaller one. The one on the west wall had been enlarged, better for evening sun, I guess. 
I walked over to the south window. The closer I got, the slower I walked. Something in my mind was telling me that I didn't like that window. I couldn't remember exactly why, but that window had some sort of bad memory attached to it. I pushed that away. I was an adult, a college post-grad. I had no time for childish fears. I reached the window and looked through. There was the forest as I remembered it. The sun was nearly vertical, casting shadows on the forest floor. There was nothing among the trees. I looked carefully. Now, why'd I do that? Why would there be something among the trees? Carol came up beside me. You okay? That snapped me out of it. Yeah, fine, though. Something doesn't matter. Cool room, eh? She smiled. Yeah, but very masculine. I grinned, too. We'll just have to put up with that. We went back downstairs. Grandma had lunch ready for us. Barney, I noticed, had been evicted from the sofa and was now on his mat. We sat at the table and dug in. There's something about the country's fresh air that just makes you want to eat, diet or no diet. What do you think of the house, dear? Grandma asked Carol. Carol swallowed and replied, It's great. Not at all what I expected from the outside. What's the deal with the window in Tatiana's uncle's room, though? She seemed a bit freaked by it. Grandma thought for a few seconds, then grinned. Ah, that would be Tatiana's hairy man. Huh? Was the best response I could come up with. Grandma put on her storytelling face. Don't you remember, dear? When we used to come up here with your mother, you'd go into your uncle's room and look out the old south-facing window. You'd come and tell us you could see some big hairy man out in the woods and drag your mother and me up to see. We never could see anything, and I never understood why you just didn't take us out to the back porch. You always were a bit odd as a child, saying you saw things that no one else could, like the little gray men at the bottom of the field that one day at Black Butte. A vivid imagination, I think, and one that you seem to have grown out of. I blushed a bit at that, but it did bring back memories. I used to go into my uncle's room when I was younger and look at the forest. It was so close and so thick. Sometimes I'd see something out there. Among the trees would be a figure, tall, taller than my father, and covered in dark reddish-brown fur. I never knew what to make of it. My uncle is a teaser. He loves to wind people up. I thought he might have set up something in the woods to scare me. Mostly, it didn't. It always bothered me, though, that whenever I managed to get my mom and grandma upstairs to look, it was gone. I would look out with them and could never see it. It was like it was only there when I was looking alone. And no, it was not my imagination. It was real, I swear. Later in the afternoon, Grandma got in her car and disappeared down the track in a cloud of dust and stone. She'd left us the number of the nearest neighbor. He lived about 300 yards down the road, but the forest was so thick you'd never know it. We fed Barney, watched some TV, and then headed upstairs to bed for the night. My uncle's bed is so huge that there was plenty of room for the both of us. As we settled in, Carol asked, Did you really see a Bigfoot out there? I don't know what it was, I replied, lying on my back. I explained how I thought it might have been something my uncle dreamed up. There's more, though, isn't there? Carol pushed. She knew me so well. I rolled over and looked straight at her. Yeah, there was one afternoon late in the day. I pulled Mom and Grandma up here again, and we'd seen nothing. They left, laughing at me. I was about 14 at the time and not happy at being laughed at. I stayed here, my eyes just above the window ledge, watching the forest. I don't know how long I stayed like that. 
The whole thing is a bit hazy, but I saw it come back. It poked its head around one of the big trees out there. I was angry. I stayed crouching there, staring at it, loathing it. God, I hated it. Why wouldn't it come out when other people were in the room? I trailed off, and Carol prompted me again. Is that all? I was struggling with my memories. Some things seemed clear, but a lot didn't make sense. I don't know, I said. Honestly, the whole thing gets real vague and weird about then. Tell me, she said quietly. Tell me whatever you remember. I rolled on my back again, trying to clear the fuzz from my mind. It saw me. It must have. It faced the window, looked up at me. I saw its face, almost human, eyes bright, startling. I was so angry, I just stared back. Then it moved away from the trees. It headed for the back porch. It wasn't moving fast, just loping, almost casually and never breaking with my gaze. I broke. I ran so fast to find my family, to warn them, and, Carol asked, engrossed. I concentrated, but nothing came. That's the weird part. I can't remember. I remember running out the bedroom door, down the hall, but then, nothing. The next thing I can remember is that we had a barbecue that night. No Bigfoot, no scary, hairy man, no mention of it. Carol pulled her side of the blanket up tighter. Geez, weird. I shook my head, trying to clear the fluff out of my brain. Yeah, was the best I could offer. And that thing was just out there, she asked, in the glow of the nightlight. I could see her hand waving in the direction of the south window. Yes, but that was years ago. My uncle's been up here for years and never said anything about any Bigfoot. Maybe I dreamed it. Thinking that way made me feel better, safer, and more secure. Mm, Carol said. I'm going to find it hard to sleep tonight. I'm not, I said, scrunching down under the covers. It was true. Whatever memories I had were already fading again, replaced by the comfort of the soft bed and a good friend. I drifted off almost immediately. I can't say much happened the next day. I know I slept in late and did, well, pretty much nothing. Barney really took almost no looking after. He was so grateful to be allowed on the sofa that he'd just stay there and pretend to sleep. Maybe he was like a child. If I don't look at you, you won't look at me and kick me off the sofa. I was restless that night. Carol had already gone up to the room, but I couldn't settle in. I'd had a shower, but was still in no mood to head to bed. Instead, I grabbed a soda and walked outside. It was a beautiful night. The sky was clear, and the half moon and stars bathed the clearing around the cabin in soft light. I inhaled deeply, letting the cool, crisp night air fill my lungs. It seemed to relax me. I walked off the porch, leaned my back against the rail. The tension, the restlessness, seemed to fade away, and I was about to head back to our room. Then I heard a noise. There was a rustling among the trees. Idly, I looked at the tree line about eight feet from the cabin. I couldn't see anything moving. Then the rustling came again, followed by heavy thuds. The thuds seemed to be getting louder, faster, approaching like the footsteps of something unusually heavy. I froze, unsure of what to do. It sounded like an elephant running through the forest. My heart thumped almost as loudly as the footfalls. My palms suddenly felt damp. The tension that had vanished only moment before returned in full force. What was coming? Then it came out of the woods. It was the same shape I remembered from my youth. Tall, man-shaped, covered in dark fur. My thoughts were muddled, confused. It's a person, my uncle's back playing tricks. It's not a person, it's too big. It came out of the forest, 
Something is wrong. It's not right. I remember. I froze, not wanting to draw attention to myself. It didn't help. The thing looked my way, its eyes locked with mine. Somehow, even in the semi-darkness of the evening, I froze. I couldn't move. I felt paralyzed. I felt my own will had vanished, replaced by an overwhelming command to stay still, stay here. I felt like a gazelle in a TV documentary being stared down by a lion. There was more, though. Thoughts, memories flooded through my head. Everything that had happened to me in the past, all the strange things, they made sense. I didn't like it, however. I felt that my role in those events had not been voluntary or happy. It took a step toward me. I felt my fear rise even higher. My heart was beating faster than I could ever remember. I could feel the adrenaline flooding my blood, but I still couldn't move. My mind was screaming for me to run, run now, not again, get away, but I couldn't. I was rooted to the spot, just a few feet from the door, and safety, I couldn't move. I heard the window above me open, and Carol's voice, Tatiana, you out there? The thing looked up. As soon as its eyes left mine, I felt my control return. My muscles, primed and charged, powered me onto the porch, and through the back door, I slammed it behind me, throwing the bolt. I refused to look out and see if it was still there. It scared me too much, and I had no desire to meet its gaze again. I grabbed my phone, rang the neighbor, begged, pleaded for him to come and take us away. I screamed at Carol to grab our stuff. We were leaving. He arrived a few minutes later. He said he couldn't see anything outside the cabin, but I was in no mood for discussion. We left. I was shaking so bad, I couldn't even put the seatbelt on. Carol had to do that for me. I did remember to call Barney, though. I wasn't leaving him alone with whatever it was. Grandma arrived the next morning. She took one look at me, and she said she'd take Carol, me, and Barney back to Sacramento. On the trip back, in the light of day, she asked me about the experience. I told her everything I remembered. To her credit, she listened, and she didn't judge. There was no comment about an overactive imagination this time. She asked me what I remembered when I looked into the thing's eyes. That's when I hit the wall. I remember remembering, but I don't remember what those memories were. It's so frustrating. It's like I have the answer to everything that happened to me, but I can't remember it. I just remember that I once knew it. These days, I don't take vacations in the woods. These days, I like resorts. I want to be surrounded by lots of people. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!